Yeah, a lot of people seem to be going on about fibre recently and how important it is, how critical it is. But of course, there's too many studies now that are showing that it isn't, and quite the reverse, saying that some things can be really improved. As you can see, there's been a few studies, one released this week, um, but the highlights of the studies have been things like uh, reduced colitis symptoms, induced clinical remission of Crohn's, inhibits intestinal inflammation, basically reduced rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. Um, one of the things is they're seeing that fiber is feeding specific microorganisms uh, in the mucosal layer that they're critical for the development of diseases, these uh, microorganisms. So just uh, just a little bit of telling you basically what we're talking about here. Uh, the lumen is the middle part and the mucosal layer is around there. This is one of the diagrams taken from one of the studies. But basically what they're finding is that fiber is making the uh, microorganisms that absolutely trigger inflammation, they're able to proliferate. And that's taken from cell host and microbe as the study there. And it, it was just basically saying that um, that fiber was was developing this microorganism, this path, pathobiont, as they call it. And um, it says there, the researchers reported the appropriate localization of a specific pathobiont in the mucosal layer is critical for disease development, which is disrupted by fiber exclusion. So that was the first study there. Um, so those that are saying, hi, and the, by the way, that isn't old news. That was a two, 2023 in November. So that's really a recent study. Uh, this study there, a high fiber diet synergizes with, they, they call it pre coprey by the way, and exacerbates rheumatoid arthritis. And basically what they were saying that um, they were studying it and also comparing it to um, a diet with no plant foods and plant food diets of doing all that sort of thing and they saw that removing the fiber from the diet was improving health conditions related to autoimmune d diseases it definitely um, reduced the symptoms of autoimmune diseases like Crohn's and Crohn's and uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, they actually said a high fiber diet exacerbated arthritis via microbial alterations and intestinal inflammation so I think that's an interesting thing as well. But the reason I'm showing you the study is because many people don't like anecdotes. Real people having resolutions, showing that their gut is improving, having less inflammation, less Crohn's, less gas, less wind, um, be, because they've removed fiber. I mean, basically, this is what a carnivore diet does. A keto diet re removes quite a lot of fiber, so does low carb. And one of the things I was going to ask you viewers out there is I'm now going to make these notes as PDFs. And I was wondering if anyone knows how I can put them up online somewhere so you could just download them anytime you wanted. I'm just flicking through so you can see that there are lots of keynotes, lots of studies, and you can you could give these to friends if you wanted to, giving you a lot of stick about, you know, you should be eating plant-based stuff. Um Lots of little bullet points. Oh, the other thing is that um, the fiber-based processed foods, they benefit from shareholders. They benefit shareholders uh, at the cost of long-term health, basically. So Yum Brands, PepsiCo, McDonald's. The blue is showing you the profit in the last uh, uh, reported year of 2022. And this is 2012. And you can see that they're all much more profitable. Nestle, Unilever, Coca-Cola, McDonald's much more profitable since they've been really pushing the plant-based foods. So um, lots of things for you to have a read of. I'm just showing you how much information there is. Also, when you talk about short-chain fatty acids, a lot of people say that you need butyrate from dietary fiber in your colon because that will then go into um, the TCA cycle, basically. But you can also get short-chain fatty acids from circulating ketones from the liver or from protein by isobutyrate. And what is great about the blood side providing this is you if you save your body doing uh, two of the processes. So beta-hydroxybutyrate goes straight in here and uh, acetoacetate goes in here just before it gets into the mitochondria. So the dietary fiber gives you all the disadvantages of... Um, gas and bloating and all of that sort of stuff and ketones of course don't give you any of those problems so if, if you want to get into that um and like i say all the all of these pdfs will have links to studies and it's just basically it starts off nice and easy to read and, and in layman's terms and then it gets into much more detail so if you're interested in that um there you go
that. So let's remove that from the screen. So this is a PDF where you can see the study and it was just an interesting one. We're not looking at big statistics, we're looking at mechanisms. So they took seven young, healthy, normal males and uh, females and the researchers, what they did is they kept them on a weight maintenance diet containing at least 250 grams of carbs per day during the study period. And on study days, the subjects fasted for 12 hours and then we give them one of the following. 438 grams of potatoes, so almost a pound. 438 grams of potatoes plus 37.5 grams of fat, which 45 grams uh, of butter. So basically, butter isn't 100% fat, so there we go. 121 grams of lentils, 121 grams of lentils plus fat. So uh, not all at the same time, but different things. So uh, they wanted to see what was going to happen. So the potato obviously was a rapidly absorbable carbohydrate, while the lentils were a slowly absorbable carbohydrate. And what they measured was glucose, they measured insulin, and glucose-dependent insulotropic peptide, or GIP, I say. The, the discoveries that were made in this study, and they've been replicated and um, there are more modern studies will be very interesting for people that are wearing a continual glucose monitor and uh, both the lentils and the potatoes consumed with butter provoked a much lower glucose response than the potato and lentils alone in other words consuming fat along with the highly and not so highly absorbable carbs diminished the glucose response. So I have tried to make this a bit more simple, but basically this is the glucose response. And if you had potatoes, just potatoes, this was the elicited response. This is potatoes and fat, as you can see. And lentils up here. And the bottom one is lentils and fat. So what's the point there? Well, the point is if you're you're looking at a continual glucose monitor and you have carbohydrates on their own, uh, by the way, none of this is advice yet. This is just um, talking about it because um, I want you to see the whole thing. If you have a continual glucose monitor, you're going to see your glucose go up more with potatoes than with potatoes and fat. Not saying that you should mix them. Right, so uh, let's go to the next thing, which is, so yeah, there's your potatoes, there's your potatoes and fat, there's your lentils, and put right about the bottom, lentils with fat. So that looks pretty interesting, but let's have a look at the insulin response. And this is where people get a little bit confused because the blood glucose or continual glucose monitor is doing great work but it's not showing you the whole story. And this is what I'm always talking about behind the scenes. How much insulin are you producing to get this response? In the paper, the authors say that differences are not significant. But so there we go. So this is the insulin response just to potatoes, quite high. Can you see that? Uh, and the potatoes with fat. And it's sort of similar to the blood glucose re response, isn't it, really? The potatoes were the highest, potatoes with fat were second highest, and the blood glucose. So anyway, let's go into the next thing. Um, that's what the, that's the that's the original charts. But let's go into the GIP. Okay, so this is uh, this is the next thing. So the addition of fat to the carbohydrates, although it reduces the blood glucose on the continual glucose monitor. It absolutely drives GIP way up. GIP is short for glucose dependent insulin tropic peptide. So, this is a hormone that's released by the K cells. It's actually in the small intestine on the brush border. That's not on the PDF, but anyway. Uh, upon its release, the GPI sort of functions to signal to the pancreas to release insulin and glucagon, which is important, in anticipation of sugar absorption into the bloodstream. So basically, the augmented release of insulin uh, is termed the incretin effect. So this is what happens. When you consume glucose and it goes into your body and it gets into the small intestine, it will signal to the pancreas, basically, to release insulin. So this this is important. I'll tell you why the incretin effect is important. Um, because 
it shows how important it is that your small intestine is involved. So the discovery of the incretin effect dates back to the 60s. And there was another test that they did. So they administered some glucose uh, solution orally and looked at their blood sugar rise. I said, so this is the next study. So what they did is they basically gave people some glucose, maybe like this, mm -hmm, and measured once it's in your body, what does it do to your blood glucose? And then what they did was they stopped the people taking the glucose that way and intravenously put it into their veins, directly into their veins. So what they were showing was it's not blood glucose that is putting the insulin up, but actually the ingestion of glucose 